Hey there, guys. All right, today we are back with some arch armchair historian. This time, the evolution of American Army uniforms animated history. Now, previously, it's been a few months since we watched it, but we did watch the evolution of the German Army uniforms. So now we're going to go to the American Army uniforms. I've been wanting to watch this for a while, but um, just wasn't, I, I, I don't know, wasn't feeling it until now. So we're going to watch it now. Um, but before we dive into the video, make sure you go check out the links below in my description box or in my pinned comment in the comment section. Um, I have a link to my Twitch channel where I stream Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Fridays, and Saturdays from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. U.S. US Central Standard Time. I'd love it if you threw me a follow and uh, came out and hung out in the chat when I go live. Now, the other link down there is my gaming channel link here on YouTube where I'm just uploading old stream VODs. So if you just want to watch old streams that are no longer on Twitch, um, or maybe you're just not a Twitch user, you can go check out those uh, videos there below um, or in, on that channel. Anyways, the evolution of American Army uniforms. Uh, it's, pro it's honestly the trend between evolution of U.S. Army uniforms and German Army uniforms are probably going to be pretty similar. Um, to how, but... I, I'm I'm curious to hear what uh, I'm sure historian mentions in the video. Prior to the formation of a professional army, the 13 colonies were defended by militiamen or minutemen. These minutemen fought in the opening battles of the American War of Independence, such as the battles of Lexington and Concord. In contrast to the British regulars they fought, they wore a patchwork of civilian clothing. The first American regulars were equipped with muskets, much like the rest of the world. During the first years of their existence, the American military was not formally organized until Prussian officer Friedrich von Steuben disciplined them into a true fighting force at Valley Forge, where Americans began habitually wearing uniforms. These newly professionalized... I love that, uh... The, just the detail that goes into the research here is... Very amazing. Soldiers marched to victories at Saratoga, Kings Mountain, and ultimately... And, like, it's such a small thing to talk about, to go from the militiamen to the professional, professional, uh, standing, uh, army of the revolution. Um, it, it's a very small detail, but it's, you know, it's the right detail, right? But obviously, if you skipped over it, it doesn't really change too much. It's not necessarily a very important detail to just be like, you know, they could have started here with the American Musketeer and completely skipped over the Militiaman. Um, and they technically wouldn't be wrong because um, technically that isn't an army. It is a fighting force, but it is not an American arm. Um, but yeah. yeah, Yorktown. That, that uh, sounds weird. Saying it so briefly, but like you talk, uh, I, I took a, a U.S. military history course, and I me, mean, yeah, the fighting, the militia fighting forces, um, I would not call Ameri an American army, mainly because they were the militia fighting forces for their local areas, and so they, of course, had the allegiance to the concept of their state or their city not to the concept of America. However, then, the American musketeer would be more loyal to the concept of fighting for this idea of an America. Although continental militiamen were used extensively for the entirety of the war. Unlike their musketeer counterparts, Morgan's riflemen... Oh my god, we're going into the... Oh. ...who functioned as a light infantry force carried a true rifle the grooved barrels of which allowed the musket ball to spin for far greater accuracy. Uniforms of this period maintained a predominantly blue color palette, although some details of the uniform evinced a Prussian influence, particularly the cuffs and collar. Officers continued to have edged weapons at their side, a popular piece for ranked individuals of most armies around the world. The pommels of American sabers were styled after eagles' heads, further cementing the bald eagle as a symbol of American identity. American forces were able to stand their ground and hold the line during the siege of Fort Texas. Although the blue color was still prominent, there was a noticeable change in headwear, 
soldiers began to wear a type of visor cap in contrast to the taller and somewhat less fashionable Shaco style. Somewhat less fashionable. Hats. So wait, Union where is it? troops, also known as Federals, were outfitted in oh, dark. Oh shit! Going straight to the Union. Okay, blue tunics let's go. And Kepi hats borrowed from the French design. While this was the standard uniform for the Union, some regiments opted for entirely different uniforms. When the Confederate states, yeah, let's not. I don't consider them American. Seceded yeah. from the Union, the they seceded from the Union. They're not American no more. CS Army opted for a more gray and earthy but tone. A Confederate, the Confederate soldier for a good part of the early war period had to make <laughs> do with older, wrecked. less effective muskets. Killed. Zouaves were a class of light infantry regiments that were linked primarily with yeah. the French Army units. I have never heard of these before. I never heard, even in my U.S. military history course, these, these were not, I've never heard of this. Serving in North what? Africa during the time. In the U.S., it was a man by the name of Elmer E. Ellsworth, who, before the war, ran a drill company called the Jouave Cadets, who practiced in the manner of their French namesakes. Such units were raised on both sides of the war, such as the Union's 11th New York Infantry, the New York Fire Jouaves. I love the amount of, uh, as I said earlier, the amount of detail that Armchair Historian just puts into the clothing is just so amazing. As the United States began its expansionist phase, the army continued to modernize and adapt to the changing battlefield. While Springfield 1873 model musket. This musket was one of the first breech-loaded rifles adopted by the U.S. Army. It was also nicknamed Trapdoor. Previously introduced for far out western territories, the Montana Peaked Design Hat was adopted by the Army as a service cover. The Army at this time also developed a tropical lightweight uniform for its campaigns in East Asia. When the United States entered the Great War, M1, M1897 shotgun, the trench gun. While the Germans believed the weapon to be inhumane on the battlefield, even though they had no issues using poisonous gas, the M1897 was a deadly trench clearer. They had adapted much of the appearance of their British counterparts. The steel Brody helmet, often nicknamed a doughboy helmet, and khaki or olive drab battle dress. The American Expeditionary Force fought its way to victory on the Western Front. The United States saw its ground forces make their debut in Operation Torch, fighting alongside the British in North Africa against the ferocious German Africa Corps, ultimately driving the Nazis back to the Italian mainland. Taking note of the effectiveness of the German Fallschirmjäger paratroopers, the U.S. developed their own airborne troops, who contributed greatly. Oh, the detail of one of them being stuck. Oh, yes. To victory in Europe. Yes. From the night landings prior to D-Day to the invasion of Germany. The M1 carbine folding stock parachute harness. The American parachute harness was a far more effective system to land airborne forces. Soldiers could land with their weapons, whereas the Germans landed with minimal armament. American airborne infantry were crucial to the Allies' victory. Sound effects, Rangers were elite going. light infantry it. forces organized in company size formations. Rangers famously scaled Pointe du Hoc on D Day to eliminate artillery pieces which the Germans had evacuated just prior. But they also won fame in Italy at the Anzio beachhead prior to Operation Shingle. By the time of the Battle of the Bulge, airborne units had fought through most of German occupied Europe. Okay, there we go. It's a little blurry, so. M1928 Thompson SMG. The Thompson submachine gun was a popular submachine gun with an infamous past during the interwar years from gangsters. Still a fucking sexy gun. Europe, and now held their own during the Siege of Bastogne. From December 1944 to January of 1945, the battle-hardened Screaming Eagles of the 101st defended the city against determined German attacks. United States Marines under the U.S. Navy formed the bulk of the ground forces in the Pacific Theater. They carried out the light finger machine gun. The U.S. Marine Corps put together a makeshift machine gun from several various weapons. 
a grand stock and aircraft variant of the M2 Browning machine gun and a BAR bipod. In fast island hopping <laughs> campaign across Imperial Japanese territory with there. Marines planting the stars and stripes on Mount Suribachi during the capture of Iwo Jima, becoming an iconic image of the Second World War. We're gonna the go to Army Korea? Air Forces was responsible Force. for most of the aerial combat during the war. Widely recognized the by their Hap Arnold Wings insignia and their famous winged propeller on their uniforms, the Army Air Forces were ultimately responsible for the two atomic weapons. Bomber jacket was worn by Army Air Force officers, which found practicality in the aircraft, but also became a part of everyday wear. Oh my god, I just realized. Yes, they, they added the detail that the Air Force was not its own uh, branch yet. They were a part of the Army. It was unleashed on Nagasaki. Or well, there was also the Navy Air Force, wasn't there? Like, they're... And they've been out of and Hiroshima swiftly, if not controversially, ending the war in the Pacific. Following the Second World War, they would be split from the army to become the United States Air Force. Okay, yeah. Following the end of the second, the M1 carbine could, would see continued use throughout Korea and the Vietnam War. In World War, the United States infantrymen remained relatively unchanged in gear and appearance, though now they were a battle hardened force experienced on all sides of the globe. By this time, the U.S. military as a whole had been desegregated by Executive Order 9981 of President Truman. During the Vietnam War, U.S. ground forces fought not only the North Vietnamese... They even put in the music. They put in the music. I love it. M16A1 assault rifle. The M16 was a rugged rifle platform. While it was said to not jam under any conditions, Vietnam disproved this due to the harsh jungle climate causing the gun to malfunction or not fire at all. ...and their guerrilla warfare tactics, they fought against the tropical conditions of Vietnam itself. Oh. God, they got the ringing. Oof. Uniforms would wear and tear until they disintegrated off of a soldier's body. A torn-up uniform came to be a mark of experience and veterancy. When the war ended, many found themselves struggling to readjust to civilian life once they returned home. Vietnam veterans remain the largest population of military vets to this day. In 1990, the Iraqi army marched into Kuwait. This was met with both economic sanctions by United Nations members and the largest coalition of allied nations since the Second World War. Live news broadcasts displayed U.S. forces clad in camouflage uniforms attuned to the desert environment during Operation Desert Shield and Operation Desert Storm in the following year. The most effective military campaign, I think, I think you could argue perhaps in history, uh, just ab the United States absolutely steamrolled Iraq in this war. Just in Iraq... At the start of the United States intervention in the Gulf War, had what? They were in the top five strongest, largest militaries at the time. I think top five. And then they just got absolutely sh When Kosovo declared independence... Oh, we are going... We're talking about Kosovo? In oh, 1999, Serbian forces were... The M4 Carbine and PAS... GT body armor. The M4 carbine was accepted in 1994 and largely replaced most of the older M16 assault rifles and used in place of some SMGs. Sent in to reconquer the breakaway republic and began a campaign of ethnic cleansing. NATO forces intervened and ended the 78-day conflict. U.S. forces were equipped with new body armor derived from earlier flak vests during the Vietnam War. The tragic attacks on September 11, 2001, saw the American troops march into the Middle East to begin the international campaign known as the Global War on Terror. To adjust to the desert environment, troops were issued an improved desert camouflage uniform and equipment that assisted them in this new battlefield dominated by urban combat. In time, the U.S. Army saw fit to consolidate their camouflage patterns. Rather than having two separate ones, it was decided to attempt a universal pattern. This pattern became the face of the American soldier for over a decade until the Army then realized how ineffective this pattern was. <laughs> Operational Camouflage Pattern Uniform Originally a civilian contract camouflage pattern limited to special forces and select units, 
the Army and later the Air Force and Space Force eventually adapt, adapted a modified version issued to all person. I always forget how long Space Force has already been around for. <laughs> The modern soldier now wears proper battle dress as the fight against terrorism continues in the Middle East. Army infantrymen primarily train at Fort Benning, Georgia, dubbed the home of the infantry. As of 2019, the U.S. Army introduced a new service uniform that harked back to the days of the Second World War and Korea, a modern iteration of the pinks and greens. The uniform that the greatest generation made famous during the 1940s it's also the best looking, like, let's be real. That army green. Beautiful. And 1950s. In Arlington National Cemetery, soldiers of the 3rd Infantry Regiment, dubbed the Old Guard, stand... The M14, M14, and uniform. The selection process for the Sentinels is on a volunteer basis, with 60% eventually unable to continue through the pipeline of this Premier Guard unit. The identification badge is third in rarity, the Army Master Badge. Oh man, I remember reading about, uh, reading about, um, essentially what you have to do to, like, be considered, like, oh, I mean, it's a high honor, it's a high, high fucking honor, uh, to be a sentinel, but also, so, so stressful. Sentinel at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. These sentinels remain as guardians 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, since April 1948. Their duty is to guard and honor those who died in combat, but whose identities remain unknown. Nice ending there with the, with the song in the background, I like it. Smooth. Alright, um, you know what, I think... Ending it there on the image of some of the unknown soldiers sitting. Um, yeah, that was the evolution of the American Army uniform animated by Armchair Historian. I have nothing to add here at the end. Um, I really like that they ended on such a somber note there, uh, mentioning the, you know, the unknown soldier. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.